It's Friday, Friday. Gotta get down on. That's gonna only be for our younger viewers. They won't know that song. Good morning. Morning has broken. And we are your consecrated hosts, Father Jeff and Jonathan. Holy orders and baptism. A little of this, a little of that. <laughs> How you guys doing today? It's a day. It, the sun is gonna shine. It's gonna be warm, hot, beautiful. Love yeah. it. I could get used to this. It hailed last night. Did it? Did you hear it? No. Oh my gosh. Woke up, all of a sudden, it didn't hail for very long, but there was something that came through. It was pounding on my windows. Staples woke up and curled up next to me because he was a little uh, disconcerted. I don't know if we got any hail. Genevieve, did we get hail? She just signed on. Did you sleep through it? I don't know if I slept through it. I was really tired yesterday. Mm. I was just sluggish the whole day. <laughs> yes. And today's Friday. It's Friday. What are you doing? Aren't you leaving? Yeah, we're supposed to go camping. When? Today. Today. Just today. We're doing a one-night trial. Oh, that's right, because this is a new experience for you and your, new your, experience. your kiddos. Yeah, it, it, are the three going with you? The three little ones? Everyone. The of children? The whole Sox squad. Wow. Wow. This is going to be exciting. Are you, like, f- catching fish and gutting them and frying them in a pan? No fish. Joshua, it's Friday. Joshua really wants to fish. It's Friday. I know. This We're not fishing. perfect day. Why? Because we don't have fishing poles. We don't have any of that stuff. Throw a net. If you people would uh, <laughs> you people tithe more <laughs> or give special funding to the Sanchez Hidalgo Fund, mm. then you could raise my salary. Right. Then I could just on a whim be like, oh yeah, let's go camping and buy all the equipment and all the fishing poles and everything we could ever need. Yeah. That and then sounds... next weekend it's like, oh, let's go mountain climbing. So let's buy all that stuff. That sounds like you're living too much in the world, Jonathan. I am helping your asceticism. All right. Well, preparing you for the kingdom of heaven. Maybe I can find a bamboo and some string and a hook. Yes. That's all and you need. An old cane pole. Bamboo pole, string, hook. And a worm. And a worm. That's how the cartoons do it. We're, we're hoping to do fishing at a later date. I've Maybe never gone summer. fishing in my entire life. Oh, Father Jeff. And well, I, my, my, my good friend, uh, Bishop Lopes, loves to fish. And so he's like, he's happy as a clam sitting in a boat. Um, and I guess fishing is mostly doing nothing. And so he's happy in a clam sitting in a boat doing nothing. So the last time we were on vacation somewhere, we were on like the canals in, down in Florida and, you know, he was fishing off the back thing. He's like, here, you have to try this. So I tried it. Like, I don't get this. Even when I pulled it up out of the thing, you know, because it was a bunch of catfish there. So nasty. you just lied. What? You have gone fishing. It, not really. I mean, I experienced. I've, done, I've held a pole in water. I didn't actually go fishing. I was there when fishing was happening. But you said you pulled and it, I tried you it. it in. Oh, I did. And there's something about that. But I'm like, you know, this is not... Uh, this is not what I love. This is boring. And so I'm like, here, I'm going to go over there now and read my book. And you can sit here and throw a pole into the water. I did not. I liked eating the fish. We caught a couple good ones. We. <laughs> he caught a couple good ones. <laughs> and we cleaned them, threw them on the grill. It was delightful. But, yeah, fishing, not my thing. It's, it's mostly nothing. It's just sitting there doing nothing. All right. Waiting for nothing. Waiting for something to happen. It's like that play, Waiting for Godot. <sighs> I've only seen it once. I don't remember it very much. You could pray while you fish. <laughs> <laughs> then you're waiting for I something to happen. I suppose that would be a pious thing to do. Yeah. I am not a terribly pious individual. You know. Well, I know that. Me. I am a fisher of men. Fisher of fish, not so much. <laughs> so... That's, you know, and that's what I'm going to stand by. Those apostles were called away from the sea, away from fishing for fish. So I'm going to let someone else do that. And I'll, I'll be a fisher of men. All right. Yeah. Well, good luck with that. Yeah. Have fun. It'll, it'll be fun. I think I have enough lights that we'll have a night light on in the tent. Oh, oh that's right. You're tenting it. We're tenting it. On an air mattress. On an air mattress. All five of you in one air mattress? There's going to be two air mattresses. You have two tents? One tent. It's one a big tent. one. It's a big tent. I think it's a ten-person Multiple person rooms? Tent. We're just going to have it one big room. Okay. Can you zipper it off into smaller rooms? 
Supposedly. I don't know how these things we, work. See, we had to buy the tent yesterday because we've never done this. You've never done this, so, so you don't know how this is working. So when you said, you know, add on the fishing poles, where it's like, I don't even know if we're going to have time to go fishing, especially we're, for today. You don't even know if the tent's going to get set up. Oh, the tent will get set up. <laughs> I don't I've know gone camping how these things and work. And I've set up tents. I just have never <laughs> set up a 10-person tent. And I tried to get this instant tent, but they, they were sold out. They said they had one. I had to go all the way to the Walmart at 100. 22nd in L, the oh L Street gosh. Marketplace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, that's my least favorite shopping center in the world because it's just whoever designed it. Yeah, the design of getting in and out of that thing is. It's a pretty, nightmare. It is a nightmare. Especially coming from Houston where everything's accessible and there's 50 million shopping centers like that, but they're so much more accessible. Anyways, I go there. I'm looking for this tent that they said they have one left online. Looking, looking. Found the spot where it's supposed to be, and there's nothing there. Uh oh. And it, I looked online. I, I was tempted to order it online and see what they did, but did you call for an, a man, a person? Excuse I did. I person? asked them. I said, "Hey, it says this is here," and they were not. Wow, helpful. our they were our not helpful. system is slow. But yeah. you found your tent. I found a, a tent. You found a tent. So we'll see how this one goes. And hopefully there's no rain in the forecast. No rain. No no severe weather. No severe no weather. Hail. So <laughs> we hope. So yeah, it should be, it'll it'll be an adventure for sure. I can't wait to hear about this. I'm excited. I'm going to take some plenty of video and it'll be, family memories will be made. That's so exciting. So I was talking to Genevieve the other day because there's an ice cream truck that came by. Mm, mm-hmm. And I was like, Genevieve, have you ever, did you ever go to the ice cream truck when you were a kid? And she was like, no. 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 Her family didn't do things like that, which is fine and dandy. She turned out okay. And see, I, she's like, I'm sure you went all the time. And No. I went less than a handful of times, but I remember those memories. Really? I Zero. And so just, you know, going, I think I got a Ninja Turtle. I think I was always distrustful of them. It was like, it was a thing you saw on television. Even back in your day? Like, yeah. I understand now why you'd be distrustful. Well, well, it was like those things you saw on television, but you never saw in real life. So when you saw it in real life, it was like, I don't know about this. You saw that on television. Now you're trying to do it. It was almost like reality imitating art, where I'm sure art would... Yeah, yeah. It was just a weird thing. I'm not, not a big fan of the... So I got Ninja Turtles, and the eyes were little gumballs. Well, I'm glad these memories have stayed with you. Yeah. Well, good. So are you saying that you ran out to the ice cream truck and got your nope, kids No, you wouldn't let me. Genevieve, I support you in that. You don't know where that ice cream's been. That's true. <laughs> you don't know where any ice cream's been. You really don't. Well, it wasn't a cow once, and then it went into a churn. Not all not, uh, not necessarily. Yeah. That's true. It could be some sherbet. could be some... some sorbet. Sh- sorbet. Could Is be... there a difference between sherbet and sorbet? I don't know. Maybe. I'm not an ice cream aficionado. Gelato. Not even I love oh, gelato. gelato. Of course. Mm. The Italian. Gelato. Mm-hmm. That's tasty stuff. It is good. It is tasty stuff. I don't even know if there's any gelato here in Omaha. Um, yeah, there are. I don't really go out and get ice cream. I'm not a person to go out and get ice cream. That's not, like, a thing for me. That's expensive. Well, it's just, yeah, I don't know. You go and get a nice, you know, like, Cold Stone. Right. They have right. some great things. But you get a thing, and it's decently sized, and it's, yeah. like, $5. For $5, you can get the whole half gallon. <laughs> I know, but the experience, Jonathan, the experience. So you go once and then say, remember this. Remember this when we open up the Blue Bunny tub. Oh, Blue Bunny. Have you had Blue <laughs> Bell? When I was a kid. That's Have you had Blue Bell down I, in Texas? Um, maybe. I'm sure. That is something Omaha severely needs. A Blue Bell? Blue Bell ice cream. Well, yeah. You know, I like the Kemp's. That's the soft. Kemp's is okay. It's nice and that's, soft. That's what I and... resort to. But nothing compares to Blue Bell homemade ice cream. All right. I'll take your word for it. I've never made ice cream either. Apparently you can do it. You can. And that's and you a, don't even need a churn. I mean, you could do... But I'm... Yeah. Anywho. That's a lot of fun, too. All these memories. Today is the Feast of St. Boniface. Let's do something Catholic now. Bonnie face. Bonnie face. No. Today is the <laughs> Feast of St. Boniface. He was the apostle to Germany. Oh. He was a mission. He wanted to be a mission. He was English, I think. And he really, really wanted to be a missionary badly. Um, And he kept getting denied. So he went right to the Pope and said, Hey, Pope, I want to be a missionary. And Gregory was like, Sure, why don't you go to Germany? Is it 
Gregory the First is there multiple? I think it's Gregory the Great. Yeah, there are multiple okay. Gregories. And he's yeah sent him off to Germany, and he apostled to Germany. And Boniface is one of those fellas. You know, he's he's one of the examples that I like to use in saying that not all saints are cut from the same cloth. Not all saints are are uh, have you, you know when you think of a saint, what do you think of? Do you think of, you know, a demure, quiet, pious, and devotional little person who's praying all day long? Do you think of someone who's a fiery preacher who's out there in the field and sacrificing and this The hammer of heretics. The hammer of heretics. Say Moses the Black. He do was you, a... <laughs> do you think of these people? Who do you think of? But but the, the, the reality is that saints come in all different shapes and sizes. and It's like ice cream. They come in many different flavors. Look at how I tied that oh, together. <laughs> they come in all different flavors. And Boniface is, is not one who sat there and rang his hands and was, you know, uh, gentle and, 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 no, no. Boniface, he came in, he saw all of these people that were... Worshipping false gods, and he was like, "Gosh, they can't be doing this." So uh, there was the 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 sacred tree that was sacred to the god Thor, and the pagans worshipped this thing and worshipped the god Thor through this tree. God of thunder. And so, what did Boniface do? He didn't just you know like say, "Hey guys, I don't think you should do this anymore because it's kind of a bad idea." Should we sit around and take a vote and see? No, no. He picked up an axe, he went over to the tree, and he chopped it down. Are you sure it wasn't a hammer? <laughs> Thor's hammer fell from the sky. The axe was more mighty than that. I'm sure he was worthy. He took that axe, chopped down that tree, and then to top it off, just to rub salt in the wound, in the pagan wound, he then took the wood from that fallen tree, and he built a church <laughs> in honor of St. Peter the Apostle, uh, and and began converting the, the pagan German people. That's what I'm talking about. This is the kind of guy. Now, eventually, I think he ticked off enough people that they killed him. Yeah, he was martyred uh, by a bunch of pagans that came through. And, uh, you know, I don't know if Boniface's personality had anything to do with that. But I just, there's something about the guy that just strikes me. It tickles me. It tickles me in his brusqueness. <laughs> Not all saints are cut from the same cloth. So when we look to these models and say, oh, I admire so-and-so, but I could never do what he or she did, that's fine. That's fine. Don't. There's lots of different paths to holiness, and there's lots of different ways to preach the gospel and to convert the nations, because not everybody is going to be sold by the same thing. Right. Yeah. Nothing to add to that? No, I think it's great. Being bold, I mean, there. If everyone was bold and in your face like that, oh, that would annoy me. It would not work. No, no. And if everyone was quiet and gentle, it would not work. No, Jesus was both. I mean, there were times when he was the gentle good shepherd, gathering the lambs in his arms, as he often described himself. But then there were the times when whips and cords and crashing through the temple and knocking down the money changers. I saw a great image of him flipping the tables with the cords and everything. It, it was a painting. Oh, okay. But it was awesome. Yeah, yeah. He, you know, there's a time for everything under the sun. So, St. Boniface, we celebrate him today. Apostle to Germany, patron of brewers, obviously. Because Not the Milwaukee. He, no, because he is the patron of Germany, and Germany is famous for its beer. Good. Good? Mmm. Sehr gut. Beer is disgusting. Mm, it's not one of my go-to spirits. It's not really a spirit, but it's uh, it's all right. I did some good craft beer. But that's okay. I'm not here to win people over. You are. You just took that axe and chopped down that tree. That's right. I don't know what Boniface would have to say about that. I think he was a beer drinker. He can drink his beer. I'll I'll, I'll keep with my water in my monkey mug. In your monkey mug. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jonathan. How about we move on to Dies Domini? That's probably appropriate. The day of the Lord. 
Isn't there a song? Every time I say that, I do start because it is a little catchy. You know, it's not, it, and the words are not horrible. They're actually the the day of the Lord. Da 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 da. On that day, bum 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 bum. That's when we get into trouble, though. But let's not talk about It's a syncopated song, so but it makes for a nice recessional hymn. And since there is no recessional hymn actually prescribed for the Roman Rite, that, um, yeah, you want to get a little creative and bouncy with your music, that's the place to put it. Once the dismissal has been given, now go in peace. Make a difference. <laughs> glorifying the Lord by your life, Jonathan Sanchez. Hey, Delco. so about that day of the church. The day of the church is what we're talking about. So we are on paragraph 34. No, not the day still of the in church chapter yet. three. The Sunday Eucharist we we're still in. Yeah, we were kind of wrapping this up yesterday, and I love that the, it makes the point in here that the Eucharist is an epiphany of the church. I don't know that we use epiphany in uh, common jargon uh, very often. We use it to describe the feast, the feast of the epiphany. But but an epiphany is a revealing. A light bulb moment. It is a. It's a seeing. Ding. So I could have an epiphany at any time. That's why people say I just had an epiphany. E God, I figured something out. E -gad. That's amazing. Yeah. E God. Short for epiphany. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't finish that sentence. Um, so it's an epiphany of the church. That means in the Sunday Eucharist. The church is realized. It's seen. You know, and this is, this is something that we were kind of talking about yesterday, that the church is not meant to not be seen, which is why just saying, oh, I can go be Catholic or I can be Christian or I can be spiritual on my own. I don't need to be a part of some organized thing. Eh, false. We do. Because we need to be seen. The church needs to be seen. It is not a private affair. Well, and, you know, in the within the context of the celebration of the Mass and the Eucharist and everything else, you talk, said revealed. Yeah. That is the church in its full glory. You see everyone gathered. Everyone's gathered, adoring and praising the Eucharist. Focused on the Lord. The, the, in, the, in the prescriptions for how churches are to be arranged, the, the point is made that the altar is supposed to be the focal point of the church, that the whole church is oriented toward the altar. So that that, so that everyone and everything is drawn to that spot because that is the place where heaven and earth meet. And that's, and then when, and you see, when you see that, when you see the people gathered, when you experience the unity and the communion, uh, the church is revealed. And the bishop becomes the sign of the unity. That that's one of the ministries of bishop. That bishop is meant to preserve the unity of the church and to gather the church together. And so even when we, in our churches, you'll notice that when we celebrate Mass, we always mention the name of the Holy Father and the local bishop. And, and that's important because it's a reminder to us that we are not some splinter group. Right. That we are not something doing our own thing. That, oh, I just made this religion up today. And I'm going to invite you all to my new storefront church. And I've got lots of stages and lights and, and you know, hip-hop music or whatever going on. <laughs> oh, that dear. that we are, we are part of something bigger. This is not my mass. It's not your mass. It is the mass of the church, which is Jesus Christ. It doesn't belong to me. We are stewards of these mysteries. And so when we, when we recall that we are in union with Francis, our Pope, it reminds us of the communion of the universal church. And we George are in union with George, our bishop, here in Omaha. And it reminds us that we are part of a larger communion of parishes, of people, of churches. Right. So everyone that George, our bishop, governs, and everyone that Pope Francis governs, Church. Yeah, which is the whole church, the <laughs> universal church. We are in union with them. Yeah. And so when you go to different dioceses, if I 
uh, cross the border and, and celebrate Mass, or when I'm on vacation and I go to celebrate Mass, uh, I, I always have to make sure it's like, okay, who is the bishop of this local church? Because where I am celebrating, that is the name of the bishop that I put into the Eucharistic prayer. So currently, if you were to go to Lincoln... Currently, Lincoln is without a bishop. The bishop is on leave, administrative leave. Connolly is, is taking some time off. For, sick leave. Yep, sick leave. Sick leave. And uh, uh, so Archbishop Lucas is the administrator of Lincoln. So I believe technically they would pray for Francis, our Pope, and George, our administrator. Okay. That they would recognize that he is the apostolic administrator or the administrator of that diocese. Yeah. When, when Archbishop Curtis retired and before, and, and in the meantime, before Archbishop Lucas was appointed and installed, we were instructed to pray no longer for Eldon, our bishop, but for Eldon, our administrator, because he was no longer the bishop of Omaha, but he was the administrator holding the seat until the new bishop was placed there. Good deal. Yeah. I just want to clarify, Bishop Conley, is, it is sick leave. There's yeah, yeah. nothing... He's taking some mental health, you know, to, to really work on his mental health. And he's been very open about that, mm-hmm. that, that he needed the time to, to really work on some personal issues, some, you know, just to get his mental health uh, in check. And I think that's important and very admirable yes. that he would put that out there for people to see and to acknowledge that mental health, we talked about that in great depth here once before. Right. That it's an important thing to to watch out and to, to take care of. Yeah, so I, just, I just wanted to clarify, just because of all the stuff. Any time a bishop know, takes leave, it could be like, like what the uh-oh. heck now? Yeah, but it is for mental health reasons, and and it'd be something good to pray for. And so when a bishop celebrates mass, they mention Francis, our Pope, and me, your unworthy servant. That they, they acknowledge that I am the one who is the the source of unity here. But that's not, you know, but, but it's like, you know, and for me, who is truly unworthy to stand in this place, um, but it is the recognition of that. So we see the church in, in the day of the Lord. Let's move on. Next paragraph, Jonathan. What do you now got? Now for the day of the church. Paragraph 25. And that is all about the parish community. Yeah. And that there is nothing greater that a physical church or parish does, than the liturgy of the Eucharist, which is Mass. Right, right. I mean, parishes do so many good things. Um, there, are, there are educational things that happen in parishes. You've got Bible studies. You've got catechetical studies. You've got religious ed courses. There are community gatherings that happen. There's youth groups that are going on. There might be, you know, card games or senior nights or, or things that are happening. Theology nights. That, that's part of the education thing yep. that happens. You might have potluck dinners. Um, so there's all these things that are going on, but they all pale in comparison with the true work of the church, and that is to affect the salvation of the world. That we are really here to extend the work that Jesus did on the cross and make that, make that a reality. Awesome. And you see that when the church celebrates on the Lord's Day. And it gathers, it gathers those, those, that community together. And, and I guess let's move on to the next paragraph then. Right. The basic building block of any community. It's the family. It's the family. You're a building block, Jonathan. You and your, you and your squad. The Sanch Squad. The Sanch Squad. And all of, you, all, of those thi- all of those squads out there, those, those families... Basic building block of society, basic building block of the church. Yeah. This is why, incidentally, this is why the church puts a huge focus on protecting the family, marriage, the family, uh, not only in the church, but in society. Because we realize that without the family, society crumbles. We've kind of gotten into a position, I think, especially in the United States, where the the right of the individual and what the individual wants is greater than the family. That, that, That as an individual, I should be able to do this, that, and the other thing. 
I should be able to have all of these rights. I should be able to have... There's some truth to that. I mean, certainly the individual dignity of every human person. Right. But the individual is not the basic building block of society. And so the individual should not be the prized component of society. Marriage, as traditionally understood, between one man and one woman who are capable of generating a family. Now, I understand not every couple uh, are able to have children, but, but men and women are. And so even if in your personal life that is not possible, you share the image of what is right. the basic building block of every society. Without husbands and wives who are committed to one another, who build up stable children in stable families, without that, you can't have society. You can't have it. No. And so that is why the church protects that and holds that as, as prime above all other rights and, and situations in, in society. So here, and thus, man. it is the parents' role, their first and foremost job, here it says, is they must teach their children to participate in Sunday Mass. Teaching the children faith. Parents are, and we've said it many times with Jackie, with our family faith formation that we've converted to, mm -hmm. is that parents are the first catechists. And then we don't just give lip service to that. No. You've got to you do it. You have to. And it, it, if it's not the parents doing it, you know, so for so long now, it's been the opposite way where they learn and teach everything at Sunday school or CCD, whatever you want it, whatever it is. Yep. And they hope and pray that it's reinforced at home, but oftentimes it wasn't. But the parents are sending them saying, oh, you're going to form my kids really well. Sending them to Catholic school does it the same thing. And instead it should be you are forming them, shaping them at home, and it's being reinforced by what they come here to do as a community so they see everybody else doing it as well. Right. And here now we're trying to teach parents and the kids how to do it together. Together. That's together. important. Because the parents need to know what they're teaching their kids and they need to be able to convey the faith to the kids because if they're not living it out, their kids aren't going to live it out. If it does not happen at home, anything done on the, at the parish level will fail and will fail miserably. That there's just not... there. I mean, there's every, anybody who has ever taught religious education or has taught even in Catholic school or whatnot... And, and you see the children who have no idea what a holy water font is, who have no idea what the church space is, uh, or who the man in the black is. <laughs> they, they, and you just see, and you just know. It's like, even though we've talked about it every single class time, it's not happening at home. Like, Jesus right. is not the center of the home. The church is not the center of the well, home. Well, if you send your kids to school, starting from kindergarten, and when they got home, you told them, leave your backpacks in the car, we're just going to go out back and play, or we're going to play yep. games tonight, and never covered what you were doing at school, never made them do their homework. One, they would fail, but two... Don't read books with If they kids. didn't have to do any of their homework or study, they're not going to learn what they need to study, right. learn just at school. And it's the same way with our faith, even more importantly with our faith. Learning doesn't happen through books. Learning happens through living. You have to live it. And, and so the Sunday Mass reveals to families their ministry as the domestic church. That what you see happening on this grand scale is what should be happening on the micro scale. Like what's happening in your family you should be father and mother with children gathered around the table, listening to the word, sharing the, the sacraments, uh, encountering life. And not every family is going to be perfect, and not every family is going to have all of those components. Nope. I mean, we, we, every it's, family is going to be broken and, and in some way, and that's okay because the church is also about healing and reconciliation. Right. And different kids. You're, there's going to be some kids that will be happy to sit around and talk about certain things or yeah. to read a story. And then others who, like mine, <laughs> I'm a great example. My kids, especially Joshua, he cannot sit still. And <laughs> it's just, so you have to work through it and... Find ways. Find ways. Ways to, to translate and communicate Get them involved the faith. And, and it's, it's still, like you said, it's a broken thing. It's it, But the p important thing is, is you stay persistent and you keep doing it. And, and I will hound on this until I am no longer standing in front of a community as, as a pastor or a priest, that it is so important to have the kids at Sunday Mass. 
that that it is that it, Saint Paul the sixth even you know he 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 gave provision for special children's liturgies and for for masses for children, but he said you know those should be few and far between, because kids really learn the faith by participating in the mass with their parents and their older siblings and the gathered community and they get familiar with with what is happening here and so it is super important that children are brought into the regular ordinary celebration of the mass i am not gonna lie i despise i hate when the kids are gathered up for the liturgy of the word and taken out of the church to go do something else first of all uh, a document that was released in 1999 pretty much prohibited the way most parishes do that today and because liturgy is not to be led without an ordained minister so unless the priest or the deacon themselves are leading those kids out of there that is not what the church intends to remove the children from the community and send them away so that the rest of us can get more out of the mass um, it reduces the liturgy to now something very utilitarian that this is something to be comprehended and understood and and that if I don't understand it here then it must not be valuable or if I if there's no distractions it's gonna make it perfect um, no that's not real life Real life is full of distractions. Real life is full of unsettledness. Real, I mean, this is the way our worship should be too. And these kids are an important part of our community. And and so we don't want to send them away. And we sell our kids short sometimes. Yeah. My kids do not pay attention at Mass. They don't, seemingly. But then, every once in a while, when they are paying attention, standing and doing what they're supposed to be doing, they'll do a response. Mm -hmm. that I'm just like... Where'd that come from? Where'd that come from? Because you were goofing off on the floor, wrestling your brother, doing other things, but they pay attention. And they are getting things, even if we don't realize it, even if it's not as much as we'd want them to, them being there, the graces and everything, they're still receiving it all. Children have their own way of perceiving. And I think we forget that. The children perceive, I think, a lot more than we think they are perceiving. And just because they, they don't sit there like this when they listen, that, you know, they may be you know, whatever, whatever, doing their thing. <laughs> but they they may be hearing what you are not hearing and what you are missing. So I just think there's something beautiful seeing uh, the whole spectrum of life brought together in the church, that all of the families, all of the households, whether you're a single individual, a widower, a widow, uh, a family newly married with kids, an adopted family, uh, it goes on and on and on. It is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Well, that's one of the things that attracted us to St. Charles. When we came here for the first time, there were so many kids where our, the noise of our kids, and they were a lot younger at that time. It's drowned out. But it's kind of drowned out because <laughs> just in the pew behind us and in the pew in front of us and the pew across from us, there's other kids also playing with some kind of car or doing other things and making noise. And it's, it's kind of beautiful to hear. The, the, There's the little, life going on. The little chatter, and it's you kind of get used to it and can drown it out. Well, I think we got to you know here's here's where one of those well we'll start wrapping this up but <laughs> but here's one of those things where you know in the 16th century prior to the 16th century when you walked into a church there were no pews in churches. That's right. Our churches were big open spaces for gathering that allowed people to mill about and to, you know, and if you attended a mass back in the day, pre-Reformation, there probably would have been several things happening in the main body of the church, which is why, and, and which is why the, the things that happened at the altar, uh, the bells would be ringing or the incense would be smoking or whatever to get people's attention, that participation was was different let's just say and uh, it wasn't until all of that stopped and in the protestant reformation protestant preachers really focused no longer on offering the mass and people being there for the offering of the mass but rather a study of scripture that we're going to read scripture and then we're going to preach very long sermons about it and then we'll say some prayers sing some songs and go home 
And when that happened, the life was constricted to just listening rather than participating in an action that was going on in whatever your state of life was. It is now, oh, I'm supposed to sit here and just absorb and listen. To have a camera that could go back and record, you know, even just in the fifth century. Yeah. So, you know, so, I mean, obviously we'd love to see Jesus's life, but yeah. to be able to go back and see that, and I know we, you can read up on it and do other things, but just to be able to somewhat experience what yeah. mass was like through the centuries would be... It's okay cool. if, it, I mean, the mass is meant to draw us all together, but there's going to be some rich differences and there's going to be some diversity and there's going to be... Um, yeah, it, it, I, I don't know what we think of when we think of like a perfect mass that, again, well, like we started off our conversation. Not every saint is going to be of the same personality and cut from the same cloth. And so even in the celebration of math, you're not going to have like all masses must be so pious and devotional. All masses must be so spirited and emotional. All masses must be... There's a, there's a cut across that I think you should be able to find something of everything. But there are limits. In that. Of course there are. There with are all limits. things. Just yes. as with sainthood, you can fall off the, the boat. Uh, so you can with liturgy as well. But the, the Sunday celebration brings those people together and joins them in a unity. Yeah. I think well, just to close out that paragraph so we can move on to the Please next do. one. It's that when we do have so many different groups and things at the parish that are doing their own thing, that that Sunday Mass is when they come together to be unified yes. in the one thing that they are unified in, which is the faith and the Mass. Yeah. And so that is... What we do. If you're a member of that Bible study or that small prayer group or that, you or know. Or the Knights of Columbus. Whatever or... that group is that you really get nourished in, when you come to the Sunday celebration, all of those small groups now are brought together and all of the individuals are brought together all for the same purpose, and that is to offer thanksgiving for the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ to the Father that saves the world. Which ties everyone together and makes it so. We're all in this together. Mm. Go away, Jonathan. We're all in this together. That's from High School Musical. Go away. <laughs>